I wanted to do some honorable mentions. These will all be, of course, films that uh, almost made this top 10 list or, you know, also films I really adore. But once you really get into the universal horrors, you wind up having some affection for all of the films. And then there are certain films that really grow on you after a while, um, several of which are in this honorable mention. So uh, I'll just do these chronologically. These are not ordered in any way uh, because it was very difficult to come up with 10 to begin with. But uh, all of these have uh, really special characteristics, I think, set them apart a bit from some of the other films in the uh, monster cycles of their respective uh, creature or character they are following. So uh, to just run through them chronologically very quickly, uh, I want to spotlight first uh, the 1936 Dracula's Daughter, which I alluded to before. It's really the line in the sand for ending the primary golden age of horror in terms of the universal canon. Uh, it is, it's not a perfect film, but it's a very interesting one. It's one that people like to read a lot of subtext into, uh, since it is the titular character of Dracula's daughter. And there are scenes where she in particular is you know, following and actually having female victims. Uh, there is a subtext there that uh, I do think is, is very interesting. I, I, there are a lot of really great, uh, well thought out, uh, critical pieces, particularly, more so in the past few years that are really digging into the subtext of the film. But it does have an energy to it. It does have some of that 1930s spark of the classic era of universal horrors. And it is technically a direct sequel because it starts right where Dracula ends. And rather amusingly, the film opens with uh, Van Helsing, still played by Edward Van Sloan, uh, being arrested for the murder of Count Dracula. But uh, the, the real insult of the film, and I think one of the things that uh, is going to most throw people when they first come to it, is there's no Bela Lugosi as Dracula. And they didn't even, uh, the studio did not even give Lugosi the courtesy of being able to play his own corpse. And you get one cutaway shot of this very fake looking corpse or, uh, instead of the iconic Lugosi performance. But his spirit definitely hangs over the film, and it is aided by the fact that Edward Van Sloan is back as Van Helsing, but interestingly, without his classic uh, accent from the original 1931 and Todd Browning film. Uh, so it, it's 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 sort of a strange beast. It's, it's in between two different eras, and it's technically the last uh, of the horror films that were produced under the banner of the original uh, Universal under uh, the Lemley family. But uh, the, the thing that uh, most strikes me about the film is the fact that it was almost made by James Will, <laughs> and there was a whole script prepared, and it was going to be almost like really the follow-up to Bride of Frankenstein and going into pure flights of fancy. And I think it's one of the great lost films, the James Whale, uh, Dracula's Daughter, that they were basically getting him to do. And so imagine James Whale going to, uh, you know, hitting the same levels, if not maybe even going further than he had in Bride of Frankenstein in terms of the inherent satire and the black humor and the sense of the macabre. Uh, it just it, it boggles the mind that we didn't get that film. But anyway, uh, it's a film that definitely grows on you, and it does have some of that 30s energy to it. Plus, it does have a really interesting, great cast and a number of really nice set pieces. And uh, interestingly, it does sort of have a chase back to the original castle so you sort of get universal finally doing a version of the ending of the original dracula novel with the long cross-country chase back to the castle from the start of the book of course it's very abridged but uh, if you're a fan of dracula you will of course recognize that immediately um but yeah it's 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 one of the more interesting films, and so that's why it's in the honorable mentions section. Uh, I just wanted to spotlight some films like that that really stuck out. Next would be 1940's The Invisible Man Returns, which is the first and uh, technically kicking off the new Invisible Man series and cycle of films for the 1940s. As I alluded to before, I really do think if you add up the quality level of each of the individual films and uh, of the actual cycles of each of the characters and monsters, uh, I think the Invisible Man films actually are the strongest overall because uh, every, every other series either starts to peter out very quickly after the second or third film or didn't get those because Universal had transitioned over into what became known as their monster rallies where they would combine as many characters into one film as possible. Uh, Invisible Man Returns, it, it is a little bit slower paced. It has a slightly longer ro run time, um, but that does allow you to sort of get into the atmosphere a bit more, get into the characters a bit more. It is sort of like, in some ways, a retelling of the original film in terms of the plotting and things, but it does have the 
interesting difference of that uh, it is the uh, a relative of the original Invisible Man, uh, who is also a scientist who uses the formula to get an innocent man off of death row, and then you have an even bigger of a ticking clock scenario from the original film where uh, the formula drove uh, the original Jack Griffin mad. And here it is a ticking clock of can the scientist character find the antidote before the character goes mad in this film. And of course, at the same time, uh, since he's out of prison, he decides uh, that he's going to try and prove his innocence and find the actual murderer and the guilty party. So it's, there's a lot going on in what is still a relatively short runtime, and it does have a more leisurely pace, but the effects, again, are fantastic. Uh, with each Invisible Man film, the effects actually get stronger and more complex and uh, more daring, really. But the great draw, aside from the typical uh, wonderful cast of all of the Universal Horrors, is that the Invisible Man is played by Vincent Price. A re very relatively early in his film career, uh, he did a number of films at Universal and uh, several in the horror genre. Uh, this would be right after he had done 1939's Tower of London. But uh, it's he's absolutely wonderful. And of course, uh, it's incredible hearing his voice and knowing that he's playing the Invisible Man, even though it's not technically the same Invisible Man of the original film. Next would be 1942's Invisible Agent, continuing on in the Invisible Man series. Uh, this is a full-on World War II propaganda piece in terms of it being a morale booster. It is a heck of a lot of fun. It's technically not a horror film, again, like The Invisible Woman. Uh, Universal seemed to try and use The Invisible Man series to do different things. Uh, this is a full-on World War II spy drama, essentially, where the... Uh, distant relative of the original Invisible Man still has the formula somehow and decides to put it to good use uh, for the U.S. Army and basically parachutes into enemy territory and uses it to wreak havoc as the new Invisible Man uh, behind enemy lines against Nazi and Japanese forces. It does have some bits of comedy, does have some bits of levity, but of course it's most going to resemble a Hitchcock film essentially of the same time period if you really want to get down to it. Uh, it's incredibly well made. Again, the effects are even better this time around. Again, every time John Fulton is just pushing it farther. And it has a, an enormous impact on uh, films to follow. Uh, in fact, it is another, like The Mummy's Hand, that I swear had to have influenced Indiana Jones in a number of ways. Uh, right down to the fact that one particular character, uh, Peter Lorre playing the uh, Japanese agent, uh, and rather, rather wonderfully in, in a very uh, cold and, and uh, malicious demeanor. But uh, if you look at his costuming, particularly in the opening sequence where they appear and they're trying to uh, basically torture the formula out of the hero before he can, uh, you know, get to the U.S. Army. But if you look at his costuming and uh, right down to the black overcoat, the demeanor, uh, his his quietness and the glasses. He wears a particular pair of glasses throughout the film and a, a black hat. He is a dead ringer for the character of Tote in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So um, I, I think this is another film, uh, even from the Universal Horrors, like The Mummy's Hand, that is a direct influence on Indi Indiana Jones and Spielberg and Lucas. And uh, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. I'd say it's very reminiscent of some of the earlier propaganda-based films uh, from the same time period. Uh, things spring to mind like uh, the Errol Flynn vehicle Desperate Journey, which is a fantastic film, uh, with similar things where you have a, basically a small uh, band of soldiers behind enemy lines wreaking havoc. Here it is much more uh, lighter in tone, but you do have darker bits, and again, a fantastic supporting cast, and it's just uh, so much fun. Then I'd have to mention 1943's Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, which again is the first of the monster rallies, and it's really the only true Wolfman sequel that we ever got. Uh, really the first third to almost half is a Wolfman sequel where you finally see the transformations, you see the full moon, the effects are far better, it's very polished, and the opening five minutes, uh, that opening sequence is one of the most atmospheric in the entire universal horror canon. So it's really unfortunate that the film sort of fall, starts to fall apart and it feels like the uh, two primary characters are sort of jammed together when we have Larry Talbot searching for uh, the actual literal Dr. Frankenstein. 
it works, but it is always a bit on the disappointing side because it was a transition into a different type of film and this monster rally. But it's beautifully photographed, extremely atmospheric, and iconic in a lot of ways. Uh, and I still love the film. I love things in it. It's one of those that I just I wish was uh, you know they had um, you know just done a straight Wolfman sequel uh, first before doing this uh, the this monster rally type idea. But it still works. It's still extremely effective. And again, that opening sequence is absolutely a stunner. Uh, next, I'd also say the 1943 Technicolor remake of Phantom of the Opera was the horrors being pushed back into a feature territory. Uh, Universal decided they were going to mount another uh, Phantom of the Opera production after the 1925 iconic original with Lon Chaney Sr. had been such a runaway success and really is what uh, put the first inklings of this this horror boom for the company in people's minds. Uh, of course, you could trace back even further to Cheney's success and Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1923, but Phantom is the one that really cemented that. And the 43 version, while it's not as good of a film and it's not as dark or atmospheric, it does have charms of its own. It is a lighter film, and they make the Phantom character sympathetic this time, and they give him a tragic backstory and Claude Rains returns and gets to play the, the Phantom and does well with this particular characterization. Um, it's definitely much more heavily inspired by its musical leanings. Uh, there are fantastic opera performances, and the Technicolor photography is absolutely gorgeous because this is in the three-strip era, and it's beautifully lensed. It's a very ornate film, and that does sort of outweigh the horror elements, but... Uh, it, it took a number of, of, of times that I saw it. It grew on me eventually. It does have some some comedic base. It does have some light humor. It is rather well-rounded overall. It's, it's, it's a true entertainment. It's extremely well-mounted, but you're going to find yourself looking more at the photography and the production values and the musical numbers than the actual horror elements, uh, although there are some nice ones there. But it's interesting to note that Universal tried doing another um, horror film as a big budget A feature, and it was successful, but uh, they quickly went back to just producing them as B films. Next, I'd like to also mention 1943's Son of Dracula, which is a very, honestly, the first time you see it, it's very bizarre. It is one of a kind, and it sticks out uh, uh, even at this point in the Universal Horrors, because it's it's a very odd beast. It's very intelligent and yet also dumber than a bag of rocks in places. <laughs> it makes the this version of Dracula look like an idiot for most of the runtime, but there is a menace, there is an atmosphere. It is set in Bayou country, but it's, it's basically a film noir. It's a film noir in horror movie clothes is what it is, and that makes it just intriguing as hell it's it again it's a very odd beast uh, you have Luncini jr playing the film's version of dracula it's also the film that invented the icon now iconic cliche of no one being able to figure out who in the heck this mysterious count alucard is and it takes people five or six times spelling it backwards or looking at it through a mirror to realize it's just dracula backwards uh but it's again extraordinarily atmospheric and the central story conceit I is brilliant. Uh, it takes a little while to get there. And again, unfortunately, when you're not dealing with that material, a lot of the other characters are dumber than a bag of rocks. So that that it, that is kind of going against it. But it's just such an intriguing premise. Once you finally see the film, it's a film I don't like to spoil because it, it's totally unexpected. It's it's uh, it comes out of left field and it's really, truly interesting and actually doing something with the notion of vampirism uh, that, it, again, it feels extraordinarily modern it is a film noir in horror movie clothes which of course makes sense because it wound up being directed by robert c Odmack, who also went on and was about to do some of the great film noirs and of course it did help that his brother kurt c Odmack had already written the wolfman and wound up writing this film too although apparently uh, Robert was not a fan of his brother, so uh, wound up, I think, rewriting some of the film himself, if I'm understanding it correctly. But there was some bad blood between the two. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting outlier, even in you know the the early to mid 1940s Universals. And of course, I have to mention at the very least Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein for 1948. 
I always tend to view the Abbott and Costello films since they were really the final nails in the coffin for the classic horror characters. It took me a long time to be able to appreciate them. Like, you know, I enjoy Meet Frankenstein. It's it's a great classic of its kind. But I always look at the Abbott and Costello films as, as sort of a separate thing because it just it, it always hurts seeing the, the monster characters kind of get lampooned and uh, the makeup effects were no longer the intricate, beautiful artistry of the Jack Pierce designs. They were much more streamlined because they were not being done by the Westmores. So there, there's there's a lot of things where you can definitely feel the writing is on the wall for these films in those. But uh, I've, I've now been able to come more to terms with them. Growing up, I used to really actively dislike them because I felt like they were making fun of, of, the, of the monster characters and the great films of the 30s that I just adored. But uh, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein is a classic for good reason. It's the first of these. It's the best of them. Uh, and it really manages to tick all the correct boxes. And it's an absolute charming delight. Plus, you have Bela Lugosi finally returning as Dracula. And it's actually the only other time he actually he literally played Count Dracula is in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. He played other vampiric characters, but this was the only other time he played Count Dracula. And that, along with Lon Chaney Jr., once again playing Larry Talbot, a.k.a. the Wolfman, it's, you know, it makes it absolutely essential to pay the price of admission. And it really is pioneering a lot of the horror comedy genre in a lot of ways. It's still one of the absolute greatest examples of the perfect horror comedy. And that's why I at least had to mention it. But again, I, I still to this day, I have this sort of innate thing in my head where I always look at those films separately, even though, you know, it's basically like really because it was the death knell, the final nail in the coffin uh, of the universal horror monster characters. And then, of course, the last honorable mention will be 1954's Creature for the Black Lagoon, which always gets grouped in it and its two sequels with the monster characters and creature always gets packaged in the primary box sets with the main monster character films but again i always look at them a little bit separate because they are much more of the 1950s science fiction craze era it's fine to box them in with the with the other horror films but they are kind of their own thing they are mostly science fiction films anyway but Creature is an absolute classic. It's a delight every time you go back to watch it. Uh, what really makes it is its atmosphere, its its great cast, the 3D photography, of course, the underwater photography, but its ability to make you feel empathy for the for the creature of the title and its its ability to hold back. Like I said with the Mummy before, its ability to have uh, to achieve some level of eloquence by holding back by not you know throwing a bunch of things at the screen not relying on jump scares and allowing the atmosphere and the sense of dread to really come through that's what makes it special and again it is one of the handful of truly great 3d films it is beautifully photographed and again uh com that combined with the underwater photography also in 3d uh you know when you think about that from a technical standpoint for the era it's absolutely mind-blowing but uh, that, that is the last of my honorable mentions, even though, again, I sort of consider it its own slightly separate thing because it is a 50s science fiction classic, and it is a different era from the classic horrors of the 30s and 40s. But it's, it's fine to group them all in together, and I know not everybody has, makes that distinction, but I usually do. 